Hello, everyone. Oh, wait, are we live? Are we live? Oh, we're live. Hello, everyone. I think, anyway. Let's make this big. Yep, this is some of live. Okay. Apologies for the lateness. Yeah, sorry, okay. we're late. We had a dodgy laptop. So we've got an even dodgier one now, but at least it works. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the second part of this chat, the first one being about the early stages of labour, or the first stage of labour. Um, today we'll be talking about the second stage of labour, so what happens after you get to 10 centimetres. Um, and probably answering lots of questions, I think, is the, the general vibe. Oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, take it away. I'm handing over to you. Okay. <laughs> I just sort of wanted to check. So I wasn't sure if actually the last time it was just early labour that was covered, or if you actually did the first stage of labour, as in um, established labour. Can anyone answer that question that's watching? How many people are watching? Ten people are watching. Okay. Ooh. Um, maybe speak to us, somebody. Have a ve very quick recap. I'm just worried that the first stage of labour hasn't been talked to uh, talked about. Oh, fine then. Yeah, delve in. Delve um, into the first. Who would be? Yeah. Okay. So early labour. Um, if it, if I know they definitely covered that. So. Um, okay. That's when your body's getting baby into a really good position in order to start opening up and then um, releasing babies to come down and then out. Um, but actual established labour. So that's when you know we want to be involved. This, this is when we want to be looking after you and making sure everything's normal for you and your baby. Um, not, you know, right at the beginning when it's just starting and you're better off at home in order for it to carry on progressing. So for first time mums, you know, by definitely by the time you're having three and ten minutes, we want to have heard from you. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to come straight in, um, but we want to assess it. Because um, everyone's different, we want them to be a good minute long, and you could be having sort of very short ones, three and um, ten minutes, and and that doesn't mean that your baby's coming out very very soon, sort of thing. So, ring us, and we can always um, guide you from there. Second time mums, when do you like them to ring? Oh, I go on what people are saying generally, because yeah. they know more so about their labours. Yeah, definitely by two in ten minutes. I want mm. to have heard from them. Um, but as Sarah said, you, you guys have had a baby before, so you, you know what happened last time and, and, and when you feel like you need to be looked after. Um, so this is the first stage of labour, you know, from three centimetres-ish to when you're fully dilated. Um, so that's just a quick recap of that. And the contractions will get stronger and longer and closer together all throughout that phase, okay? Um, and we certainly want to have be have you in the place where you're giving birth by the time you're pushing baby out. So that is the plan. That's um, the plan. That is the plan, yes. It doesn't always happen, but mostly it does. Mostly, yes. Do you want to go from there, Sarah? Well, yeah, I was just going to say a little bit about second stick, because I think people have in their heads and people know that 10 centimetres means that they're fully dilated, and I think that's what people are sort of always waiting for. Um, but the second, so the part that then follows is pushing your baby out. It can take up to two hours before we sort of uh, would want a review or to assess where where baby is. So it's not like the end, the end goal isn't necessarily the 10 centimetre realm. <laughs> and I think, because I think people know 10 centimetres in the head from film and from um, like film and television and stuff like that. But after then that follows can take a little bit of time, it's quite normal for that to happen. Um, should, should we go through sort of what to expect? You've got some handy posters. I've got some handy posters, there might be a bit of a reflection. Okay. So, we've got one here where the membranes are intact. Okay. I'm going to hold it really, really close. Oh. Da, 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 da. Not too much reflection on there. No, so you can see bad. the uterus and you can see the baby's head and that the cervix is completely gone, fully dilated. 
and you can probably see the bulging membranes in front and below there is the short vagina that the baby is going to emerge from. Okay, what are you going to be feeling like by this time, folks? Good question. Yeah. So for most people, there will be an overwhelming urge to push. It's like you really need to go for a poo, and it can be quite sad for some people. Um, and it can be quite overwhelming, and that's when typically people get a little bit frightened or a bit more... Um, I think they hold back a little bit because they're worried that they're going to open their bowels, and that can happen. That's quite normal. And that urge to push happens... Oh. Sorry, I'm back with my photo, but my picture again, because... I don't know if you can point out where the back passage is, Sarah. Mm. Oh, that way, <laughs> come this way. It's all the, it's, it's around, here we go. Is it? Yeah. No. Yeah, where's the back passage? Well, it's here, it's being compressed. Yeah, exactly. Isn't that it? Oh, that's the front. Oh, it's here. I was going to say, that's the bladder, isn't it? <laughs> right, yeah. So that's why you get that amazing urge to push, because it's just, that's what it feels like. You've got the ginormous poo in your bottom. Um, fine. Okay. Yeah. I've actually got a bit of a visual thing here. Have you? Well, oh, marvellous. Right. That's probably oh, better than my picture. What is that? Oh, no. Oh, leave her alone. She's terrifying. This is my baby. She's in a uterus, okay? So, you're going to have to angle it a bit better for me. Do so. what you want. Yeah, down a bit. Down a bit. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so let's put her in this bit of shit. Okay, so throughout labour, sorry, I'm going to go back again before we get to the pushing, okay? Um, throughout labour, what your body is trying to do is make the cervix, this is the cervix, okay, which is long and closed. Let's pull this down. Ooh. Long and closed like this and your baby is inside and above it. And the whole point of labour and contractions is so that, that, that this shortens and thins down um, and then is able to release baby with the pushing stage. Now the word contraction isn't always actually the best explanation of what's happening because that makes you think that, oh my baby's fat. Um, it's just squeezing. It is, but actually the uterus is also pushing, pulling up which is what pushes the baby down onto the cervix, which is close to begin with, but then it starts shortening and eventually opening as well. So, squeezes, pulls up, and then baby starts to come down. And this cervix is opening and, short and shortening, okay? So, lots of contractions. Um, they could have been going on for a day or so if, you, if it's your first baby, probably a bit shorter if it's a subsequent baby, but what you're actually trying to get to is the 10 centimetres dilated. Do you have a feel? Does that sound feel about right to you? Yes, lovely. Yes, perfect. Yeah, okay, so now, so all the cervix has disappeared, it's fully dilated, and now your baby's got to come out. But actually, what people don't realise is it's got to come down before it's got to come out, and that's why it is an instant. They don't come out very quickly, especially if you've never done it before, okay? So the pushing stage can take a little while, can't it? So this is baby upper cervix, not the, not the vagina, okay? It's still got to come down further and for you to be able to see it, okay? And then usually, at some point, people will get this overwhelming urge to push. Like everyone's very different, aren't, aren't they? Yeah. And it completely depends where you are and what sort of birth you're having. Um, if it's a, a very physiological normal birth, whether it's where it's all happened sort of naturally and it, drug free, so it's not um, hiding any of the symptoms or, or the pains or the feelings, your body does usually literally go Ugh, like that. It's something you can't help but do. It's just doing it for you, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And therefore baby is uh, coming down and then eventually out. However, not everybody feels that, and not right away either. You know, you could have an examination if that's uh, needed or required or wanted, um, and be 10 centimetres dilated, your cervix 10 centimetres dilated, but actually you need longer for it to come down in order to yeah. feel that ejection reflex. Yeah. So um, other people, especially when, it's, when you've had more than one baby before, sometimes that can happen 
really, really quickly, can't it? Once they, once they feel that urge to push, baby can come up rather quickly. Also, the water's breaking, so we've got the picture of uh, where they're intact. Oh, I've got an intact. Yeah, the foot. Wrong way around. Sorry, folks. Just have a look. So we can see. Yeah, so if you can imagine, so this, this, this is the cervix here that's been pulled right up. Um, it, it's not in the way of baby's head anymore, so fully dilated, about 10 centimetres. But if you can imagine how hard the uterus is working there and um, pulling up, so baby's being pushed down, at some point the waters are likely to, to go here. They're, they're going to break because of the pressure of the contractions. Now it's often right at the beginning of labour that that happens, or right at the end, wouldn't you say? Absolutely, yeah. Really, yeah. yeah. And um, if they haven't already and somebody started pushing, then it's likely to happen and, and we often see a baby quite soon afterwards because there's a big change in there. There's no cushion anymore in the way of the baby's head um, and baby is often sort of born quite soon after or certainly starting to push quite soon after that as well. Um, where's the picture? Yeah, so you can see that that's enabled baby to come down even further. Yeah. Sorry about the reflection. I think that's quite clear. Right, okay. okay. Do you want to add something before my baby's head's born? Um, before the baby's head's born, I was just going to say that t routinely we sort of... Um, routinely we will wait to see what happens after about an hour, after recognising that you're fully dilated. Um, and if we can't see your baby already or your baby's not already born, that's when we will offer an examination to see whether we can determine what position your baby's in, whether there have been any changes, whether they have descended in the vagina very much. Um, okay, now that was it. That was all about an hour. Okay, so what were you just saying? Uh, about the moulding of the baby's head. Yeah. So that's quite oh, that's quite good. Yeah. yeah, turn it the other way and then they can actually see it. The shape of the baby's head. That way? Well, no. oh. <laughs> it's opposite on the. Yeah, but you know, then they can see the shape of the baby's head properly. But it's all yeah, so on. at this stage when the baby's in the birth canal and the vagina, the baby's head's moulding very well. So people quite often will worry about the size of their baby's head, but that's the beauty of the baby's head. They've been designed for the bones to slide over each other. It's called moulding. And we've only just started to see the baby's head at this point. Yeah. Just the top of it. There you go. There you go. There you go. Um, I'm not ready to birth my baby yet, no. actually. I've been pushing for a little while and I feel like not much is changing. Fine. And it's really annoying me. I'm getting fed up. Okay. Um, what can I do? How can I help me get it out? <laughs> so this is where we would be encouraging you to move around to mobilise as much as possible as the same as um, the earlier stage of labour to mobilise just sometimes a change of position Would and you changing have... your your mm -hmm. legs from a Sorry. inward mm -hmm. to an outward motion can encourage the baby to descend further in fact we've got a peanut ball somewhere mm -hmm. here yeah. but Would you like to sit on the toilet Fiona? No <laughs> Okay But I should, shouldn't I? You <laughs> seem to know what you're talking about. Why should I do that? <laughs> well, it's a really, it's a really helpful, good position to actually, because you actually you feel like you want to put push. You'll feel those surges, and you'll feel like you want to push. Don't worry, your baby will not be born in the toilet. We'll make sure of that. Yeah. Um, and it's also a really good idea to empty your bladder as often mm -hmm. as possible yeah. at this stage as so well. Sitting on the toilet is a good idea. It is. Oh, it works a treat, doesn't it? If um to hurry along labour at this stage, I would say. Um, there's something called sphincter law by Arne Magaskin, if you want to read about it. Um, it's psychologically, it's, it's a big release for us. We open up because actually that's what we're used to doing on the toilet. You let go um, because you're so used to doing it in that, in that place, in that environment. Not just the toilet, but even just um, a, a small, smaller room where you feel a bit safer or maybe less watched, you know. Um, that might be part of it as well, not just the toilet itself, but um, getting out of the pool perhaps, or just a big change of position, um, 
feeling like it's a normal place to open up. It just works really well sitting on the toilet. Doesn't mean you have to stay there either, but often someone will and then they're like, oh, oh, they can feel something different is happening or that suddenly you'll be able to see the baby even um, and you can get back to where you were comfortable or back into the pool and stuff if, if, if that is the case. Yeah. Um, what do I interrupt? Um, I was just going to say, and just to say that because you get that feeling, if there is, is anything in your back passage, it's going to come out. It's got to come out before your baby. You're going to poo. We see it all the time. We actually really like seeing it because it means things are happening, things are moving. People get embarrassed about it, they get worried about it, but we really like to see it. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, that worked for me, didn't it? Did it? Yeah. yeah. Oh! Um, <laughs> I need a word as well. Um, yeah, I'm on the toilet, I can feel something, oh, something's changed, something's really changed, what should I do, what should I do? I don't want you to have your baby on the toilet. What would you like to do? <laughs> I, think, yeah, I think I want to get on the floor, but I don't actually want to get on the floor in, in, in front of you. That's good actually. Um, but that's often what happens, isn't it? Get, up, get on with the knees, and then um, I feel more of an urge to, to push, mm -hmm. and we still have to see something. Yes, yes. yes. So, oh. Yeah, so we can't see on there. Oh, sorry. Oh, there you go. Oh, that happened very suddenly. Sorry. So, um, so with each contraction, I'm now on all fours because that's that's what felt normal to to me in a good position to go go in. And my baby is starting to you start to see more and more of baby's head as I have a contraction. Yeah, and it's very normal. Sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say it's very normal for your baby's head to be rocking backwards and forwards. So this can take some time. Again, it's not just immediately your baby's going to be birthed, but this bit you can see just a little bit of baby's head and then quite often when the contraction has passed, it will recess a little. And that's very, very normal, very common. So we're still seeing the top of the baby's head. We've not seen the brow, or the eyes, or the nose yet. That's going to be born quite soon. Mm -hmm. How are, they fe how are you feeling at this point, Fiona? What does that feel like? <sighs> it's it's silly. <singing. laughs> Only a tad. Yeah, but I'm really just glad it's happening. <laughs> um, and we haven't actually talked about the monitoring throughout this. Maybe we should come back to that. I'll try come back to that. Okay, fine. Um, so each contraction, you can see a little bit more of baby. Um, it was going sort of in, back in and out each time, but I've got sort of past that point. What's your anus? Sorry, because we got because we might have a nice warm compress here. We would have put that on before on your perineum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we got brown. Providing you're out of the pool. Yeah. Okay. That's about his head, whole head. Okay. And now, what lots of people don't realise is that there's often a, a pause here. Should, should I hold the baby? Go on, you can, you can birth me. <sighs> it is warm. Okay. Yeah. Um, what do you want me to do? Well, I was getting, because uh, uh, presumably you're going to show about restitution. And well, can we do that on here? You're not on all fours then, you're actually more of an I feel like someone else should do that, seeing as I was pregnant with this baby. In fact, yeah, I'll hold it. <laughs> okay. So I was in all, all fours, wasn't I? Let's pretend. Okay. I still well, am, okay. No, it's fine. It's all right. okay. It's all right. You're, you're going to work with this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. To, to it. The T-shirt the isn't going to lend itself as, as uteruses do, but that's fine. That's okay. We'll, we'll work accordingly. Fine. So we've got, had a head, and then I'm waiting for the next contraction. contraction. Yeah, and sometimes this can feel like a bit of a long wait, because there can be a little bit of a delay now, can't there? Yeah. And your baby might be blowing bubbles, might be wriggling at this point. Yeah. 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 Um, and then we wait for the next contraction, which is usually met with either an urge to push or maybe directed to push accordingly. And then, um, are you going to hold your Yeah, I'll hold it. I've just realised this baby's got a baby grow on. Um, <laughs> that won't happen. So typically what will happen <laughs> here already dressed. is your, your baby will turn. And this is so that the... Sh this isn't going to work in this, is it? Probably not. No, so the, the, typically here the baby will rotate so that the shoulders are in line with the pelvic outlet and that's so that your baby can pass through. Does that with a little bit more ease than with a t-shirt, admittedly. 
<laughs> Here she comes. <laughs> yeah, this baby. That's it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and then immediately. <laughs> A baby grow on. They don't usually come out and baby grows. And then that's when obviously we'll promote skin to skin and hand to baby for yes. some lovely skin to skin. Thank you. You're welcome. Congratulations. Um, so can see there's any questions. Oh, there is actually one question. Okay. So Emma is asked, first time mum, naive question. Do waters always break in the second stage of labour or can they break in the first stage? Emma, they can break at any time. Um, and they can break before labour has even started. That's also very common. Yeah. Um, um, as we've just said, it's often the pressure of the really intense contractions near the end. So that's why it's quite common for it to happen then, but it doesn't have to happen then, if that makes sense. Also, because it's a big change in the, in the, in the body, so there's a bubble here of, of waters in between um, the baby's head and the cervix, once they break, there's more pressure on the, onto the cervix, and therefore it's usually quite a big change. Which is also why sometimes when the waters break, and that's the first bit of labour, then it starts labour, because something changes internally. So that's why usually it's either at the beginning, or at the end, but it can be sort of any time in between, aren't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it is... I mean, everyone has waters, and they will go at some point, yeah. um, but they all, they all go quite differently, don't they? So... Look after her. What do you want? Um, a picture of like waters. Have you got them right earlier? Yes, yes. You've got them yeah. in a well, I've only got that one. Um, Sorry, bear with me. But Emma, essentially, they can go at any time. Okay, it is quite a good picture of it. Um, sometimes they can sort of burst up here. Let's say. In which case, as baby wriggles and stuff like that, water will sort of travel from down the side um, and it will usually happen quite slowly and like a trickle. But it'll be continuous because there's lots of water in there and it's coming, it's coming out in little bits. Um, however, on TV programmes, definitely on Friends, you know, when they're like, your water broke, we've got to get you to the hospital. <sighs> That's not, that's yeah, not that needs work. Sorry. It's not necessarily true, but that is when usually there's quite a big gush of it. So if you can imagine when that breaks. So that's what usually happens at the end of, uh, end of labour, that that bit goes. And it's, there's quite a gush. Um, but as I said, it can break sort of further up and then it's more of a trickle a lot of the time. So that's where some people think that they've got two two bags of waters or if it's broken twice but actually it's the same it's the same lot but sometimes this can trickle and this this will still break at some point so there can semi be two stages to it if that makes sense is that badly explained probably no i think that makes sense um obviously with waters breaking it doesn't mean you have to come to the hospital straight away we like to know about it sure write down the time that it happened and we like to know the color yeah. Um, it's, we, we, we would like it to be clear, maybe a bit pinky, straw coloured. Um, if it's brown or green, um, we want to know about it. Don't panic, it's quite common. It's when babies had a, had a poo and we don't quite know the reason for it. Yeah. Probably just because it needs a poo, but we just don't ignore that. We want to know about it, okay? Yeah. Equally, if, if you were to be preterm and that, for that to happen, we'd encourage you to speak to MAU as well. Yeah. So that's before 37 weeks, make sure you. Um, tell us if that happens straight away. Yeah. Right. Um, was there more questions? No, that was it on the question pad so far. One. Fine, okay. Um, we were going to say about monitoring, weren't, weren't, weren't we? Yeah. So, in the, remember the first stage is uh, established labour. If, if you're being looked after by someone like here or at the JR. Um, we want to know baby's okay, so we're monitoring it. They've probably touched on this before, but we listen in like here or at home with one of these for uh, every 15 minutes yeah. in the first stage of labour um, for one full minute, and it's after the after we've felt a, a contraction as well. Um, and in the second stage of labour, because we know baby's being squeezed, they are designed to cope for cope with it, but we we want to know if there's any changes because there is more likely to be. 
um, we listen to them a bit more often, either every five minutes or after each sort of contraction. Um, just have a really good idea that baby's coping with it well. And they tend to, they are built to withstand it, all right. Uh, yeah. Um, and if you were on delivery suite or having any continuous monitoring for whatever reason, mum, baby, both, um, this is when it can be quite, it, this is when we will quite often notice that baby's heart rate goes down at the, at, during contractions. And that's very common, as Fiona says, it's because babies are getting squeezed at this point. Um, but I think it makes people a little bit anxious if they can hear that the baby's heart rate's slowing, but it can be very normal and your midwife will pay close attention to that in any case. Um, so yeah, it's every 15 minutes during first stage and every five minutes here in the, yeah. with one of those. Um, shall we touch on the third stage, just because we probably won't do a whole Facebook Live about the third stage, would you agree? Yeah, yeah. Fine. yeah. Um, um, I was just going to say about um, yes. guarding, guard to perineal care. We promote perineal massage in um, pregnancy from 34 weeks um, to reduce the risk of, of tearing in labour. It is very common, um, but what we, if you are out of water, then what we can offer once we know that you, the vertex is visible and advancing, so the baby's head is coming towards us and we can see it. That's when we will offer a warm yeah. compress on the perineum. Mm -hmm. Some people really love it and find it very soothing. Some people really don't want to be touched. So that's entirely subjective and you can decide as and when you're feeling that on the day. Um, it's encouraged just to warm up the, the perineal muscles and that will then be applied until your baby's head is born. Now, we will also be guarding the rate at which your baby's head is born. Um, so it's a two hand job once we see that that head is coming down but again that's only if you're not in water if you're water we can't we can't do that oh, okay so um yeah if you're happy we're going to talk about the third stage of labor and this is some questions uh what do you recommend using for massage emma good question there are so many emma's on here um um, a really good question. There is a an oil, a perineal massage oil that I don't know. I think it's a, a mix of things, isn't it? And there's grape seed oil in it as well. No idea. Don't know. Don't know the exact ingredients. I will find that out. Do you mean? Does she mean massage on the perineum or massage anywhere? I I, I assumed it. Oh, okay. I assumed perineal. <laughs> there is a specific oil for perineal massage. I think it's just called perineal massage oil. Mm -hmm. Massage generally can be any carrier oil. You can mm -hmm. even put aromatherapy in there if you like. Yeah. Um, I don't think you have to be too... Um, it doesn't have to be an expensive special perineal massage oil, does it? No, it doesn't, but just be mindful that some oils are quite highly scented or they can mm -hmm. affect your pH. Yeah. She just mean perineal. Oh, fine. Okay. So a neutral pH mm. oil. Yeah. Um, if any, just in case people don't know what we're talking about, um, perineal massage is um, exactly what it says on the tin, actually. Um, so massaging the bit between the vagina and the bottom um, so that it is more prepared for stretching and, and having a baby come out of it. So the research has shown it uh, reduces sort of um, the, the bigger tears. Okay. Um, also, I found that people who have done it are also it's a bit different in second stage when they have that feeling that they need to push which for a lot of people is very strange they've never had it before and like we said earlier people fight it and they want to clench and keep the baby in and fight that feeling where your body's going Ugh. um but actually people who've done perineal massage i find are a little bit more relaxed when they get that feeling because they felt what pressure feels like from the inside going outwards um, because of perine perineal oh, massage. That, yeah, it makes sense. So a lot of people uh, find it easier to, to release when they feel that strange that strange feeling of something trying to come out from the inside. Um, it, it's We see it all the time, people fighting it, people clinching. That's our job to do the whole, yeah. you know, soften everything, make everything go nice and loose and relaxed. Um, so we're very used to it. It doesn't make you strange to want to fight it. We see it all the time. Um, 
So I, I'm not saying you will not have a baby without doing perineal massage, and I'm also not saying you will have, have a worse tear, but it has been shown to have its benefits. And 34 weeks, is it from? 34 weeks. 34 weeks. Um, sorry, we do have the leaflets, and your midwife should talk to you about it at some point in your antenatal appointment. Um, we do have the leaflets that show you how to do it and things like that. Um, but it's something to, to think about, all right. Sorry, I won't veer off. You picked up your Phoebe again. What was that for? I don't know. Pump, but... Um, we were going to talk about third stage, weren't we? Oh, yeah, we were going to, yeah. We may as well. Yeah, so when you've had your baby, when I've had my baby, and I'm just enjoying the skin to skin, um, it's great. You've had your baby, that's what you sort of were aiming for. But for us midwives, we know there's another bit um, of birth that you've got to get through. That's a third stage. So this is birthing your placenta. So the placenta is the organ that's been growing with your baby to um, keep it oxygenated and give it its nutrients. And it's a pretty amazing thing, really. But it has to come out. You don't need it anymore once you've had a baby. So um, yeah, you need to birth it. Now, there's options for this. And most people have the injection, which is a synthetic oxytocin, which helps to um, contract the uterus in order to expel it quicker for um, for the mum after that she's given birth to the baby. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's always the option to to not do that if everything else has remained normal and bleeding is okay and things like that. Then you can have what's called a physiological third stage which we're quite used to seeing in places like this, so midwifery like units and homes, because everything's been very normal throughout labour and things like that, so these people are even more um, used to having that. Whereas if you've had a medica medicated birth, there's a chance you could have had the, um, the same drug throughout your labour if you've been induced and stuff anyway, and therefore um, the injection can uh, help to reduce the bleeding basically that's yeah. what it's there for and there are certain instances where it will be recommended more so than than to wait physiologically so if you had a, a particularly long labor um if you have a particularly low bmi for example um where you may feel the effects of blood loss following delivery so there are some instances where it would probably be recommended in, in either instance but it'd be taken on a case-by-case -case basis yeah um because it can make you feel a little bit sick afterwards. Not always, but some of them. Yeah. Um, so the placenta. Have we got anything on the placenta? Um, mm. There's this. If you want to take that. Okay. I also. I'll draw a placenta. Oh, bear with me, I'm drawing a placenta. Mm. I could do a piece of paper, couldn't I, really? Yeah. Treat yourself to a piece of paper. Um, so the placenta, also known as the afterbirth, um, it's a fantastic organ. It's obviously what keep, what's keeping your baby alive. And <laughs> sorry, I got distracted by fear. This drawing, it isn't good. <laughs> hey, you weren't good at it's art, terrible. presumably. Um, there's not one of uh, the women that I look after in my case though who hasn't got that drawn in her notes somewhere. It's a terrible drawing, but to give you a bit of a sort of size reference, if it, that's, yeah, yeah, the size is all right there, isn't it? Yeah, they can be bigger, smaller, but um, that is like the size of the centre. And this is what is stuck to the inside of the, the uterus, okay, um, and is feeding the baby through the belly button. Um, so when it comes out, if you can imagine, when it's born, that is the area of, of a sort of open wound that's inside, okay? And um, your body has to work to contract all the fibres back down so that that wound uh, closes. But if you can imagine, that's what the, is open inside you. That's why you bleed. You're supposed to. It's normal to bleed after having a baby. And that is why. But obviously, we want your body to be able to cope with that bleeding and things. And that's what we're there to do is be aware of when it's more than we'd like and then um, act if it's necessary, if that makes sense. So the injection would be the first port of call. Okay. So yes, it's got to come out. And do you want to talk about what we do if you have the injection, it's clamped and everything? 
What do you mean, what we do? Well, actually helped it. Oh, fine. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Once, so we offered delay, we offer delayed cord clamping as standard practice. Delayed cord clamping promotes the transfer of red blood cells from the placenta to the baby. Um, red blood cells obviously are very oxygenated, so that's why we promote it, give it all, your baby lots of lovely oxygen. Now, if for whatever reason the baby is compromised at all, or if they require a paediatric review, then that may be done, the, the, the cord may be clamped and cut sooner, but that will be taken sort of on an individual basis. But routinely, it, we offer delayed cord clamping. Um, so once that cord has stopped pulsating, we clamp the cord and it's cut, sometimes by partners, should they want to. Um, and to deliver it, if you've had the injection, that's when someone will guard um, the uterus, so by touching your tummy, which can be a little tender at this point, by, but just touching just above the pubic bone. We have a feel of your tummy to see if it's well contracted. And sometimes this is when people can get a gush of blood, and that means that the placenta has come away from the uterus wall. That's quite normal. Some people can feel that the cord itself is lengthening in the vagina, which can be quite an unusual feeling. But again, it's just uh, reassurance that the placenta has come away and is going to deliver. We then, again, with sterile gloves, guarding your uterus with a, our second hand, we just gently add some traction to the cord and guide the placenta out. Um, I think some people are quite fearful of this because they've just had a baby, but it doesn't feel at all anything like a baby. How would you describe it? Jellyfish. Like a jellyfish. <laughs> That's a, well, that sort of texture is yeah. but it's wobbly and soft. There's no bones in it. Yeah. It's nothing like giving birth to uh, a skull a and the rest of a baby. So it's we, we know what you've just done. You've just had a baby. Yeah. You can definitely do a placenta. Yeah. Um, and after it's delivered, a midwife will check the placenta to make sure that it is, it is intact, uh, that there's no placental tissue left inside your womb. Um, we will also have a look at the lining to make sure that there are two linings of the uterus, one for mum, one for baby, and then we have a look at the cord as well. And we have a look at the overall health of the placenta. Um, oh, and you can have this all while having skin to skin, so nothing, nothing necessarily needs to interrupt that at all. You can even feed your baby, a lot of people will feed because that can again promote oxytocin which can um, Increase the speed at which your placenta delivers as well. So we do often encourage that. Um, if you're if you're hoping to avoid having the injection to have to deliver the placenta quicker, um, typically it can be up to an hour waiting for that placenta to be birthed. And we would again encourage skin to skin and feeding your baby in that interim period if you're breastfeeding. Um, as a means of promoting oxytocin through the body. Yes. Yeah. What else can we say about third stage? Um. I mean, we could talk about because we could also talk about second stage what happens if the baby doesn't make an appearance after an hour or two mm -hmm. yeah um so rewind yeah what we've been discussing is obviously very straightforward natural labor um where there have been no interventions or any sort of complications at all um but the world doesn't always work like that and, and sometimes for a number of different reasons um baby for example if you've been pushing for over an hour and your baby still hasn't made an appearance and we were re requesting a an obstetric review to see why baby hasn't made an appearance yet. Um, equally, and I should say that if you have an epidural on board, sometimes we wait up to two hours before having an obstetric review because of the urge to push can sometimes be a little less there and just to give more time for the baby to descend. Um, so after an hour or two is when we would invite um, an obstetrician to come and review the situation and recommend what their advice would be. Sometimes it is to continue to push if they feel that baby is on, on route and, it, and delivery is imminent. 
Sometimes they will have a scan of your tummy again to see and identify exactly what position your baby is in. As some babies in a slightly more difficult position or an odd position can be a little bit slower. Um, and if the baby wasn't in an optimum position, they would probably um, weigh up the benefits and risks of having an instrumental delivery, whether that would be forceps or vontus. Um, that's that one on that front, I think, on the second stage. Mm -hmm. um, anything to add in there? Um, this, this sort of thing is more likely if you've had more of a medicated birth, isn't it? And things like epidurals, obviously it changes the body's physiology inside. Everything's not completely working like it would without. Therefore, you're less likely to have that feeling where your body goes, Ugh! so often we we're not it's not completely obvious from looking at the woman sort of when she her cervix may be 10 centimeters dilated mm -hmm. it may be an examination that's confirmed this and the woman doesn't feel too much different um because she's lovely and comfortable um and therefore it is sort of it may be that we do ask or tell you when you need to sort of push um because you might not be aware of your contractions or yeah. not feeling any pressure with them yeah um so um, it softens the pelvic floor. It's it's not pushing baby down and out like it is without some of the time, not always. Yeah. Um, Emma has asked, if you are at a birthing centre and nothing happens after an hour, will you then be transferred or will intervention be offered at the centre? Uh, so typically, Emma, if the baby's not arrived after an hour, we would recommend having an assessment again to confirm where your baby is whether they've descended into the vagina, whether we can see any more of them, whether we think delivery is imminent, and again, to confirm what position they're in. Um, if there have been no changes, then we would possibly start the discussion of having a transfer. Um, at this stage, we would keep delivery suite up to date, the baby's not yet here, and we would, uh, we would inform them whether they, we thought that it was imminent or not. Um, and then typically a transfer would normally be arranged by the two hour mark. Yeah. Typically. 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 For first babies, we don't necessarily expect someone to have pushed a baby out in an hour. You know, mm -hmm. the, the pushing, like we said, you need to push baby down before it comes out. Um, yeah. So an hour is actually quite a short space of time when it comes to oh, that for a first, uh, first time mum, you know. Absolutely. But we're always sort of thinking ahead and thinking what's best and safest for your baby and stuff like that. Babies are, they are built for this. They're, they're supposed to go through labour and be squeezed often and stuff like that. But we, we're always looking ahead. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, we're a team and if there's nothing else going wrong, it's a discussion, you know, what do what what do you feel is right for you because you've been pushing for this long or whatever um you know baby's coping well at the moment but we don't know what sort of it, what will be happening in the next hour however we also don't want to sort of jump and transfer you for for no reason if baby's going to come soon so we're going to try everything um that's helpful to your labor anyway that's that's more sort of natural and you know try different positions try and get you to have a wee um sit on the toilet um, lots of uh, give you some energy maybe you haven't eaten or drank for a while and you haven't got that much energy to push your baby at the moment so we'll, we do all of those things as well to try and um, get baby out normally without other intervention okay. yeah um, but the intervention itself wouldn't be offered on a midwifery led unit whether it were a freestanding one either here at Chippy, Wantage Hollingford, I've started the list, Horton, or at the Spires, you would be transferred to delivery suite for any intervention that was necessary at the time. Yes. Yes. Um, now, jumping again to third stage then, what happens if your placenta doesn't deliver? Oh, it's annoying. Oh, it is it's annoying. annoying. It's annoying. Um, it doesn't happen that often, but it's it's possible. It's mm -hmm. one of the reasons that we may need to transfer from somewhere like this. Um, we, we need you to have your placenta. Um, it's part of birth, okay? So we work um, through guidelines and things and have, have, have 
kind of worked out what seems to be the safest. Oh, I'm actually leaning out of there. Um, seems to be the safest um, in terms of how long you should leave it and things like that, whether it's been physiological, so no drugs involved, or if you have had the injection um, after a certain amount of time, we do expect you to have had your placenta um, so that the risk of bleeding is reduced and things like that. Okay, it's not something we want, not something else that we want to go on and on. So sometimes placentas need a little bit more help, more than a midwife can do um, to, to, to get them out. Um, and we'd want you to be comfortable and in the hospital with, uh, for that sort of procedure. Do you want to carry on talking about Sarah? Uh, yeah, well, but, um, so the procedure itself is called a manual removal. Thankfully very rare, because they're quite annoying once you've had your baby and you kind of just want to rest in a uh, delicious tea and toast. Um, they are performed by an obstetrician in a theatre environment just because of the risk of infection and that is when a trained doctor would obviously remove the placenta and ensure that it was intact and so all of the tissue was removed again with it. Um, it's thankfully rare but it is quite important that we react to them um, because they can cause uh, blood loss to be heavier than we would like and that can make you feel particularly rubbish in turn um, and they're done under a spinal anaesthetic so or an epidural if you already have it cited um, to make sure that you are very comfortable so that's it um, just like having a baby the things that can help um, with the release of your placenta you still need oxytocin um, for the your uterus to contract to, to birth the placenta so we want the environment to remain calm and with the right people in it and um, not suddenly turn on lights or do party poppers or whatever. It's, we need it to remain the same sort of nice relaxed environment. So, you know, I've, I've suggested to someone who wanted to face on her dad before giving birth to a placenta that maybe she waits till afterwards. That sort of thing isn't going to help with birthing your placenta, okay? So things like breastfeeding is, that can help make your uterus contract because baby's crawling, um, doing the crawling reflex on top of it, um, working on your tummy, that helps. And so does feeding. The actual feeding itself releases more oxytocin and therefore works on your uterus. Um, weeing, again, can be the reason the placenta is, is staying in a bit longer than it wants to if the bladder is full. So that's another thing. And sitting on the toilet. Um, so we would try all those things as well before. Um, just getting you transferred and, and, and going for that option. All right. Fine. I think that's more or less everything we were going to cover. Yeah. Is there any other questions? That is just loads of Emma's talking to each other. Yes, loads of Emma's. Um, um, does anyone have any other questions before we head off? Give it a few minutes. Natalie, can you think of anything we've missed? We've got a lovely student midwife with us here, looking, uh, um, listening to what we do. I don't think so. Yeah. Um, fine. I think we're okay, you know. Was that answer? No. Uh, no, we've done all Don't these. Know. We've done these. Okay, fine. Let's um, get out of this boiling hot room. Yeah, it's so <laughs> hot in here. <laughs> Thank you for listening again. Take care. Bye. Bye. Oh, by the way, I'm Fiona. She's Sarah. I oh, don't name <laughs> us. No, I don't think we you didn't name ourselves. drop us. <laughs> no, we didn't introduce ourselves. Bye, guys. Bye.